Edward Vernon Rickenbacker was an American fighter racing World War I and Medal of Honor recipient. With 26 aerial victories, he was America's most successful fighter race in the war. He was also a race car driver and automotive designer, a government consultant in military matters and a pioneer in air transportation, particularly as the longtime head of Eastern Airlines. Early Life He was born Edward Rickenbacher in Columbus, Ohio, to Swiss-German-speaking immigrants. From childhood, he loved machines and experimented with them, encouraged by his father's words, a machine has to have a purpose. In what was to become one of the defining characteristics of Rickenbacker's life, he nearly died many times in events ranging from an early run-in with a horse-drawn carriage, to a botched tonsillectomy, to airplane crashes. His first life-threatening experience occurred when he was in the Horsehead Gang. He lived near a mine, and they decided to ride a cart down the slope. It tipped over and almost crushed them. According to Rickenbacker's autobiography, at age 13, his schooling ended in grade 7 after the accidental death of his father on August 26, 1904. However, according to Eddie Rickenbacker, an American hero in the 20th century, by W. David Lewis, his father died after an altercation with another man in Columbus. Rickenbacker found jobs to help support the family, but driven by an intense admiration for machines, Rickenbacker taught himself as much as he could, including enrolling in a correspondence course in engineering. He aggressively pursued any chance of involvement with automobiles. Rickenbacker went to work at the Columbus Buggy Company, eventually becoming a salesman. Rickenbacker was also an avid golfer, often playing at the Siwanoi Country Club course near his home. He is one of a very select few club members who were granted honorary lifetime membership at Siwanoi. Rickenbacker became well known as a race car driver, competing in the Indianapolis 500 four times before World War I, and earning the nickname Fast Eddie. Rickenbacker joined the Maxwell race team in 1915 after leaving Peugeot. After the Maxwell team disbanded that same year, he joined the Bristol Light team as manager and continued to race improved Maxwells for Bristol Light. World War I. Equals pre US entry equals. Rickenbacker wanted to join the Allied troops in World War I, but the U.S. had not yet entered the war. He had several chance encounters with aviators, including a fortuitous incident in which he repaired a stranded aircraft for Townsend F. Dodd, a man who later became General John J. Pershing's aviation officer and an important contact in Rickenbacker's attempt to join air combat. During World War I, with its anti-German atmosphere, he a Euro like many other German Americans a Euro changed his surname. The H in Rickenbacher became AK in an effort to take the Hun out of his name. As he was already well known at the time, the change received wide publicity. From then on, as he wrote in his autobiography, most Rickenbachers were practically forced to spell their name in the way I had. He believed his given name looked a little plain. He signed his name 26 times with a different middle initial each time. After settling upon V, he selected Vernon as a middle name. In 1916, Rickenbacker traveled to London, with the aim of developing an English car for American races. Because of an erroneous press story and Rickenbacker's known Swiss heritage, he was suspected of being a spy. En route and in England, agents closely monitored his actions. On a sea voyage back to America, he came up with the idea to recruit his race car driver friends as fighter pilots, on the theory that such men were accustomed to tight spaces and high speeds. His suggestion was ignored by the military. Equals Army Service Equals When, in 1917, the United States declared war on Germany, Rickenbacker had enlisted in the United States Army and was soon training in France with some of the first American troops. He arrived in France on June 26, 1917, as a sergeant first class. Most men chosen for pilot training had college degrees and Rickenbacker had to struggle to gain permission to fly because of his perceived lack of academic qualifications. Because of his mechanical abilities, Rickenbacker was assigned as engineering officer at the 3rd Aviation Instruction Center at Isaudan, the U.S. Air Service's pursuit training facility, where he practiced flying during his free time. He learned to fly well, but because his mechanical skills were so highly valued, 
Rickenbacker's superiors tried to prevent him from attaining his wings with the other pilots. Rickenbacker demonstrated that he had a qualified replacement, and the military awarded him a place in one of America's air combat units, the 94th Aero Squadron, informally known as the Hat in the Ring Squadron after its insignia. Originally he flew the Nearport 28, at first without armament. On April 29, 1918, Rickenbacker shot down his first plane. On May 28, he claimed his fifth to become an ace. Rickenbacker was awarded the French Croix de Guerre that month for his five victories. On May 30, he scored his sixth victory. It would be his last for three and a half months. He developed an ear infection in July which almost ended his flying career and grounded him for several weeks. He shot down Germany's hottest new fighter, the Fokker Divry, on September 14 and another the next day. On September 24, 1918, now a captain, he was named commander of the squadron, and on the following day, he claimed two more German planes, for which he was belatedly awarded the Medal of Honor in 1931 by President Herbert Hoover. After claiming yet another Fokker Divry on September 27, he became a balloon buster by downing observation balloons on September 28, October 1, October 27, and October 30, 1918. Thirteen more wins followed in October bringing his total to 13 Fokker Divri, four other German fighters, five highly defended observation balloons, and only four of the easier two-seated reconnaissance planes. The military determined ace status by verifying combat claims by a pilot, but confirmation too, was needed from ground witnesses, affirmations of other pilots, or observation of the wreckage of the opposing enemy aircraft. If no witnesses could be found, a reported kill was not counted. It was an imperfect system, dependent on the frailties of human observation, as well as vagaries of weather and terrain. Most ACES records are thus best estimates, not exact counts. Nevertheless, Rickenbacker's 26 victories remained the American record until World War II. Rickenbacker flew a total of 300 combat hours, reportedly more than any other U.S. pilot in the war. When Rickenbacker learned of the armistice, he flew an airplane above the Western Front to observe the ceasefire and the displays of joy and comradeship, as the formerly warring troops crossed the front lines and joined in the celebrations. Equals verified aerial victories equals. Between the wars, after World War I ended, Rickenbacker was approached several times about exploiting his fame. He chose to go on a Liberty Bond tour. After the tour he was released from the army with the rank of Major. He felt he had earned the rank of Captain and used that one the rest of his life. He was offered many movie positions, but did not want all the attention, even though he was the most celebrated aviator in America. Rickenbacker described his World War I flying experiences in his memoirs, Fighting the Flying Circus, published after the war. In this book, he also describes the character, exploits, and death of fellow pilot Lieutenant Quentin Roosevelt, the son of U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. Rickenbacker also continued to associate with Reed Chambers, with whom he had served in World War I. They jointly founded an airline. In 1925, Rickenbacker was a defense witness, along with Hap Arnold, Tui Spartz, Ira Eker, and Fiorello H. LaGuardia, in the court-martial of General Billy Mitchell. Equals marriage equals. In 1922, Rickenbacker married Adelaide Frost Durant. Their marriage lasted for the rest of his life. Although they spent considerable time in Florida, Texas and Ohio, the Rickenbackers lived chiefly in New York City. They adopted two boys, David Edward in 1925, and William Frost in 1928. Adelaide was an unconventional wife for the times, she was five years older than her husband, had been previously married, and was outspoken and active. As independent as she was, Adelaide fully supported Rickenbacker's endeavors until his death in 1973. Equals Rickenbacker Automobile equals he started the Rickenbacker Motor Company in 1920, selling technologically advanced cars incorporating innovations from automobile racing. The Rickenbacker came equipped with a first four-wheel brake system. Probably due to bad publicity from the other car manufacturers, 
who feared they would be unable to sell their inventory of cars with two-wheel braking, the company had trouble selling its cars and eventually went bankrupt in 1927. Rickenbacker went into massive debt, but was determined to pay back all of the $250,000 he owed, despite personally going bankrupt. Eventually, all vehicles manufactured in the U.S. incorporated four-wheel braking. Equals the Indianapolis Motor Speedway equals, on November 1, 1927, Rickenbacker bought the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which he operated for nearly a decade and a half, overseeing many improvements to the facility. Once the Speedway operations were under control, Rickenbacker looked for additional opportunities for entrepreneurship, including in sales for the Cadillac division of General Motors, and for various aircraft manufacturers and airlines. After the 500-mile race in 1941, Rickenbacker closed the Speedway due to World War II. Among other things, holding the race would have been a waste of valuable gasoline and other fuels. In 1945, Rickenbacker sold the racetrack to the businessman Anton Hulman, Jr. Equals crashes with President Roosevelt equals, Rickenbacker was adamantly opposed to President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal policies, seeing them as little better than socialism. For this, he drew criticism and ire from the press and the Roosevelt administration, which ordered NBC Radio not to allow him to broadcast opinions critical of Roosevelt's policies after Rickenbacker had harshly denounced the president's decision to rescind existing mail contracts in 1934 and have U.S. Army Air Corps pilots carry the air mail. At the time, Rickenbacker was vice president of one of the companies affected, Eastern Air Transport. When a number of inexperienced, under-trained army pilots were killed in crashes soon afterward, Rickenbacker stated, that's legalized murder. Equals Eastern Airlines equals, Rickenbacker's most lasting business endeavor was his longtime leadership of Eastern Airlines. Through the 1920s, he had worked with and for General Motors, first as the California distributor for its new car, the short-lived Sheridan, then later as a marketer for the La Soul, and finally as vice president of sales for their affiliate, Fokker Aircraft Company. He persuaded GM to purchase North American Aviation, a conglomerate whose assets included Eastern Air Transport. GM asked him to manage Eastern, beginning in 1935. With the help of some friends, Rickenbacker merged Eastern Air Transport and Florida Airways to form Eastern Airlines, an airline that eventually grew from a company flying a few thousand miles per week into a major airline. In April 1938, after learning that GM was considering selling Eastern to John D. Hertz, Rickenbacker met with GM's chairman of the board, Alfred P. Sloan, and bought the company for $3.5 million. Rickenbacker oversaw many radical changes in the field of commercial aviation. He negotiated with the U.S. government to acquire airmail routes, a great advantage to companies in need of business. He helped develop and support new aircraft designs. Rickenbacker bought the new, large, faster airliners for Eastern Airlines, including the four-engined Lockheed Constellation and Douglas DC-4. Rickenbacker personally collaborated with many of the pioneers of aviation, including Donald W. Douglas, the founder of the Douglas Aircraft Company, and the designer and builder of the large, four-engined airliners, the DC-4, DC-6, DC-7, and DC-8. Rickenbacker promoted flying to the American public. But, always aware of the possibility of accidents, he wrote in his autobiography, I have never liked to use the word safe in connection with either Eastern Airlines or the entire transportation field. I prefer the word reliable. Rickenbacker's near-fatal airline crash. Rickenbacker often traveled for business on Eastern Airlines flights. On February 26, 1941, he was a passenger on a Douglas DC-3 airliner that crashed just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Rickenbacker suffered especially grave injuries, being soaked in fuel, immobile, and trapped in the wreckage. In spite of his own critical wounds, Rickenbacker encouraged the other passengers, offered what consolation he could to those around him who were injured or dying, and guided the survivors who were still ambulatory to attempt to find help. The survivors were rescued after spending the night at the crash site. Rickenbacker barely survived. This was just the first time that the press announced his death while he was still alive. 
In a dramatic retelling of the incident, Rickenbacker's autobiography relates his astonishing experiences. While he was still conscious but in terrible pain, Rickenbacker was left behind while some ambulances carried away bodies of the dead. When Rickenbacker arrived at a hospital, his injuries appeared so grotesque that the emergency surgeons and physicians left him for dead for some time. They instructed their assistants to take care of the live ones. Rickenbacker's injuries included a fractured skull, other head injuries, a shattered left elbow with a crushed nerve, a paralyzed left hand, several broken ribs, a crushed tip socket, a pelvis broken in two places, a severed nerve in his left hip, and a broken left knee. Rickenbacker's left eyeball was also blown out of its socket. It took many months in the hospital, followed by a long time at home, for Rickenbacker to heal from this multitude of injuries and to regain his full eyesight. Rickenbacker described his terrible experience with vivid accounts of his mental state as he approached death a euro emphasizing the supreme act of will that it took to stave off dying. Rickenbacker's autobiography reports that he spent ten days at the door of death, which he illustrated as having an overwhelming sensation of calm and pleasure. Equals Ace Drummond equals, Rickenbacker also scripted a popular comic strip called Ace Drummond from 1935 a Euro 1940. He worked with aviation artist and author Clayton Knight, who illustrated the series. The strip followed the adventures of Aviator Drummond. It was later adapted into a film serial and radio program. World War II Rickenbacker supported the war effort as a civilian. In 1942, he taught training bases in the southwestern United States and in England. He encouraged the American public to contribute time and resources, and pledged Eastern Airlines equipment and personnel for use in military activities. Rickenbacker inspected troops, operations, and equipment, and served in a publicity function to increase support from civilians and soldiers. In 1942, with a sweeping letter of authorization from Henry L. Stimson, U.S. Secretary of War, Rickenbacker visited England on an official war mission and made groundbreaking recommendations for better war operations. Equals Adrift at Sea equals, One of Rickenbacker's most famous near-death experiences occurred in October 1942. Stimson sent him on a tour of air bases in the Pacific Theater of Operations to review both living conditions and operations but also to deliver personally a secret message of rebuke to General Douglas MacArthur from the President for negative public comments MacArthur had made about the administration and disparaging cables sent to Marshall. After visiting several air and sea bases in Hawaii, Rickenbacker was provided an older B-17D flying fortress as transportation to the South Pacific. The bomber strayed hundreds of miles off course while on its way to a refueling stop on Canton Island and was forced to ditch in a remote and little-traveled part of the central Pacific Ocean. The failure in navigation has been ascribed to an art-of-adjustment celestial navigation instrument, a bubble octant, that gave a systematic bias to all of its readings. That octant reportedly had suffered a severe shock in a pre-takeoff mishap. This unnecessary ditching spurred on the development of improved navigational instruments and also better survival gear for the aircrewmen. The B-17's aircraft commander, former American Airlines pilot Captain William T. Cherry, Jr., was forced to ditch close to Japanese-held islands but the Americans were never spotted by Japanese patrol planes, and were adrift on the ocean for thousands of miles. For 24 days, Rickenbacker, Army Captain Hans C. Adamson, his friend and business partner, and the rest of the crewmen drifted in life rafts at sea. Rickenbacker was still suffering somewhat from his earlier airplane crash, and Captain Adamson sustained serious injuries during the ditching. The other crewmen in the B-17 were hurt to varying degrees. The crewmen's food supply ran out after three days. Then, on the eighth day, a seagull landed on Rickenbacker's head. He warily and cautiously captured it, and then the survivors meticulously divided it into equal parts and used part of it for fishing bait. They lived on sporadic rainwater that fell and similar food miracles. Rickenbacker assumed leadership, encouraging and browbeating the others to keep their spirits up. One crewman, Alexander Kachmark Zyke of the USAAF, died and was buried at sea. 
the U.S. Army Air Forces and the U.S. Navy's patrol planes planned to abandon the search for the lost B-17 crewman after just over two weeks, but Rickenbacker's wife persuaded them to extend it another week. The services agreed to do so. Once again, the newspapers and radio broadcasts reported that Rickenbacker was dead. A U.S. Navy Patrol OS-2U-3 Kingfisher floatplane spotted and rescued the survivors on November 13, off the coast of Nikvtau in Tuvala. All were suffering from hypothermia, sunburn, dehydration, and near starvation. Rickenbacker completed his assignment and delivered his message, which has never been made public, to General MacArthur. Rickenbacker had thought that he had been lost for 21 days, and wrote a book about this experience titled Seven Came Through, published by Doubleday, Doran. It was not until later that he recalculated the number of days, and he corrected himself in his autobiography in 1967. The pilot of the plane that rescued the survivors, Lieutenant William F. Eddy, USN, was awarded the Navy's Air Medal for his actions during the rescue. The story was also recounted in Lieutenant James Whitaker's book We Thought We Heard the Angels Sing, published in 1943. The story of Rickenbacker's ordeal has been used as an example for Alcoholics Anonymous when the first of their twelve traditions was formulated, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. Equals 1943 mission to the USSR equals, still determined to support the US war effort, Rickenbacker suggested a fact-finding mission in the Soviet Union to provide the Soviets with needed technical assistance for their American aircraft. Rickenbacker approached Soviet diplomats, and avoided requesting help from President Franklin Roosevelt, due to their prior disagreements. He scheduled resumption of his tour of American air operations in the Far East, interrupted by his ordeal in 1942, while he awaited approval of his visit from the Soviets. With Stimson's help and by trading favors with the Soviet ambassador, Rickenbacker secured unlikely permission to travel to the Soviet Union. The War Department provided everything Rickenbacker needed, including a highly unusual letter stating that the bearer was authorized to visit any areas he may deem necessary for such purposes as he will explain to you in person, signed by the Secretary of War. Rickenbacker's trip in the spring and summer of 1943 took him along the South Atlantic air route that Eastern Airlines had helped pioneer in 1941, traveling to Cairo in an AAF C-54 provided him by General Henry H. Arnold, commanding general of the United States Army Air Forces. He made observations about conditions at every stop and reviewed American operations with a critical eye, forwarding reports to authorities. From Cairo he traveled by C-87 to India to experience the hump airlift into China, on which he reported unfavorably to Arnold after his return to the United States. Continuing over the hump to China himself, Rickenbacker was impressed by the determination of the Chinese people but disgusted with the corruption of the Kuomintang government. Reaching Iran, he offered to bring along an American officer to the Soviet Union although approval of the request delayed Rickenbacker's party several days. In the Soviet Union, Rickenbacker observed wartime conditions, the extraordinary dedication and patriotism by the populace, and the ruthless denial of food to those deemed unproductive to the war effort. He befriended many Soviet officials and shared his knowledge of the aircraft they had received from the United States. He was lavishly entertained and recalled attempts by NKVD agents and officials to get him intoxicated enough to disclose sensitive information. Rickenbacker's mission was successful. He discovered that a commander of Moscow's defense had stayed at Rickenbacker's home in 1937, and personal connections like this and the respect the Soviet military personnel had for him greatly aided his information gathering. He learned about Soviet defense strategies and capabilities. In the destruction resulting from the outbreak of the Battle of Kursk, he saw a map of the front line showing the locations of all major Soviet military units, which he did his best to memorize. He also persuaded his hosts to give him an unprecedented tour of the Shtamovic aircraft factory. But it was comments made by Rickenbacker during his trip that alerted the Soviets to the existence of the secret B-29 Superfortress program. Rickenbacker observed some traces of capitalism and predicted that the Soviet Union would eventually become a capitalist nation. 
British Prime Minister Winston Churchill interviewed Rickenbacker about his mission. In the U.S., Rickenbacker's information resulted in some diplomatic and military action, but President Roosevelt did not meet with Rickenbacker. Later life and death, although his main home was in New York City for many years, Rickenbacker owned a winter home in Coconut Grove, Florida, near Eastern Airlines' major maintenance and administrative headquarters at Miami International Airport. For a time, Eastern was the most profitable airline in the post-war era. During the late 1950s, however, Eastern Airlines' fortunes declined, and Rickenbacker was forced out of his position as CEO on October 1, 1959. Rickenbacker also resigned as the chairman of the board on December 31, 1963, at the age of 73. After that, Capt and Mrs. Rickenbacker traveled extensively for a number of years. In the 1960s, Rickenbacker became a well-known speaker. He shared his vision for the future of technology and commerce, exhorted Americans to respect the adversary, the Soviet Union during the Cold War, but still uphold American values. Rickenbacker endorsed many conservative ideas. In 1967, when Rickenbacker published his autobiography, a special edition was printed for the employees of Eastern Airlines, and it contained the following dedication. To the men and women of Eastern Airlines, it is with pleasure and pride that I inscribe to you this copy of my life story from the time I was three years of age. You will find therein the source of those principles I used to preach. And if they can help you avoid even a few of the keen disappointments and bitter heartaches that I have lived through, then I will feel well repaid for my efforts. From these principles and our labors together emerged one of our country's great airlines and further developed our great heritage of pioneering. In the years ahead young, strong hands will carry them into a future which you and I, with all our dreams, can scarcely visualize a euro that parade of youth, which always was and always will be the true spirit of Eastern Airlines. Signed, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, Captain Rickenbacker suffered from a stroke while he was in Switzerland seeking special medical treatment for Mrs. Rickenbacker, and he then contracted pneumonia. Rickenbacker died on July 23, 1973 in Zar 1 Quarter Rich, Switzerland. A memorial service was held at the Key Biscayne Presbyterian Church with the eulogy given by Lieutenant General Jimmy Doolittle, and then his body was interred in Columbus, Ohio, at the Green Lawn Cemetery. In 1977, at the age of 92, Adelaide Rickenbacker was completely blind, suffering from failing health, and still grieving severely from the loss of her husband. She committed suicide by gunshot at their home on Key Biscayne, Florida. Honors and awards. Equals military awards equals. Medal of Honor Citation. Edward V. Rickenbacker, Colonel, Specialist Reserve, then First Lieutenant. 94th Aero Squadron, Air Service, American Expeditionary Forces. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty in action against the enemy near Billy, France, September 25, 1918. While on a voluntary patrol over the lines Lieutenant Rickenbacker attacked seven enemy planes. Disregarding the odds against him he dived on them and shot down one of the Fokkers out of control. He then attacked one of the Halberstads and sent it down also. Medal of Honor Citation, awarded November 6, 1930. First Distinguished Service Cross Citation. The Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Edward Vernon Rickenbacker, Captain, U.S. Army, for extraordinary heroism in action near Montsec, France, April 29, 1918. Captain Rickenbacker attacked an enemy Albatross monoplane and after a vigorous fight in which he followed his foe into German territory, he succeeded in shooting it down near Bignall's Leigh Hatton Shaitl. General Orders No. 32, W.D., 1919. Second Distinguished Service Cross Citation. The Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Edward Vernon Rickenbacker, Captain, U.S. for Extraordinary Heroism in Action over Rishi Court, France, on May 17, 1918. Captain Rickenbacker attacked three Albatross enemy planes, shooting one down in the vicinity of Rishi Court, France, and forcing the others to retreat over their own lines. General Orders No. 32, W.D., 1919. 
Third Distinguished Service Cross Citation. The Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Edward Vernon Rickenbacker, Captain, U.S. Army, for extraordinary heroism in action over St. Myel, France, on May 22, 1918. Captain Rickenbacker attacked three Albatross monoplanes 4,000 meters over St. Myel, France. He drove them back into German territory, separated one from the group, and shot it down near Flyray. General Orders No. 32, W.D., 1919. Fourth Distinguished Service Cross Citation. The Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Edward Vernon Rickenbacker, Captain, U.S. Army, for extraordinary heroism in action over Boise Rate, France, on May 28, 1918. Captain Rickenbacker sighted a group of two battle planes and four monoplanes, German planes, which he at once attacked vigorously, shooting down one and dispersing the others. General Orders No. 32, W.D., 1919. Fifth Distinguished Service Cross Citation. The Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Edward Vernon Rickenbacker, Captain, U.S. Army, for extraordinary heroism in action on May 30, 1918, 4,000 meters over Jolny, France. Captain Rickenbacker attacked a group of five enemy planes. After a violent battle, he shot down one plane and drove the others away. General Orders No. 32, W.D., 1919. Sixth Distinguished Service Cross Citation. The Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Edward Vernon Rickenbacker, Captain, U.S. Army, for extraordinary heroism in action in the region of Villacy, France, September 14, 1918. Captain Rickenbacker attacked four Fokker enemy planes at an altitude of 3,000 meters. After a sharp and hot action, he succeeded in shooting one down in flames and dispersing the other three. General Orders No. 32, W.D., 1919. Seventh Distinguished Service Cross Citation. The Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Edward Vernon Rickenbacker, Captain, U.S. Army, for extraordinary heroism in action in the region of Bois de Wevril, France, September 15, 1918. Captain Rickenbacker encountered six enemy planes, who were in the act of attacking force pads, which were below them. Undeterred by their superior numbers, he unhesitatingly attacked them and succeeded in shooting one down in flames and completely breaking the formation of the others. General Orders No. 32, W.D., 1919. Equals other equals, Rickenbacker was inducted into various halls of fame including the National Aviation Hall of Fame in 1965, the International Motor Sports Hall of Fame in 1992, the National Sprint Car Hall of Fame in 1992 and the Motor Sports Hall of Fame of America in 1994. He also received the Tony Janis Award in 1967 for his contributions to scheduled commercial aviation. What is now Dobbins Air Reserve Base was originally called Rickenbacker Field in his honor when it opened in 1941. In 1945 20th Century Fox made a movie called Captain Eddie. It starred Fred McMurray as Rickenbacker. In November 1947, a four-mile causeway was completed, linking Miami on the mainland of Florida with Crandon Park on the island of Key Biscayne. The road was named Rickenbacker Causeway in his honor. In 1974, Lockburn Air Force Base, a strategic air command installation in his hometown of Columbus, was renamed Rickenbacker Air Force Base. On April 1, 1980 it was turned over to the Ohio Air National Guard and renamed Rickenbacker Air National Guard Base. It now shares the airfield with Rickenbacker International Airport. The Rickenbacker Award is the Civil Air Patrol Cadet Achievement equivalent to an Air Force Technical Sergeant. Cadets awarded the Rickenbacker Achievement are promoted to CTSGT. The United States Postal Service issued a postage stamp in honor of Rickenbacker's accomplishments as an aviation pioneer in 1995. The postage stamp was reprinted in 1999 and reissued in 2000. Cultural references In his comic strip Lyle Abner, Al Cap included an airplane pilot modeled on Rickenbacker, Cap on Eddie Rickatieback. Rickenbacker is featured as a character in the pilot episode of the science fiction series Voyages. He was played by Peter Frechette. 
Eddie Rickenbacker appears in the computer game Red Baron as one of the Allied aces. In the 1999 game System Shock 2, a military spaceship is named the UNN Rickenbacker. Wings of War, Famous Aces features Rickenbacker's SPAD-13. He also appears in the World War I simulation game Rise of Flight as an instructor. In the 2007 movie The King of Kong, A Fistful of Quarters, Billy Mitchell compares Eddie Rickenbacker with the Red Baron to illustrate his own dominance of competitive video game playing, stating there's a level of difference between some people. In 2009, musician Todd Snyder wrote a song called Money, Compliments, and Publicity, which revolves around a statement Rickenbacker made indicating that the pinnacle of success is when you lose interest in money, compliments, and publicity. In the 1955 film The Court Martial of Billy Mitchell, Rickenbacker is played by Tom McKee. In the Twilight Zone episode The Parallel, it is mentioned that, in the parallel universe, Rickenbacker was never found after the crash of Eastern Airlines Flight 21 on February 26, 1941. In the 2004 novel The Godfather Returns, Nick Gerasi is reading Eddie Rickenbacker's autobiography. His father quotes from the sleeve of the book. Rickenbacker Guitars Eddie was a distant cousin of Adolf Rickenbacker, co-founder of Rickenbacker Guitars. The company name was purposely chosen for the association with Eddie Rickenbacker. See also, List of Medal of Honor recipients for World War I, Captain Edward V. Rickenbacker House, List of World War I Flying Aces from the United States. References This article incorporates public domain material from websites or documents of the United States Army Center of Military History. Bibliography, Adamson, Hans Christian, Eddie Rickenbacker, The Macmillan Company, New York, 1946. Blank. Joan Gill. Key by Skane, Pineapple Press, Sarasota, Florida, 1996. ISBN 1-56164-096-4. Fa, Fa, Finnis, Rickenbacker's Lucky Euro in American Life, Horton Mifflin Company, Boston, 1979, ISBN 0-395-27102-9. Franks, Norman, A.L. American Aces of World War I Osprey Publishing, 2001. ISBN 1-84176-375-6. Fox, Ian. Rickenbacker, Eddie Rickenbacker, 1955. An American Hero in the 20th Century, Johns Hopkins University Press, Baltimore. 2005. Rickenbacker, Captain Edward V, Fighting the Flying Circus, Frederick A. Stokes, New York, 1919. Rickenbacker, Captain Edward V, Seven Came Through, Doubleday, Doran and Company, Incorporated, Garden City, New York, 1943. Rickenbacker, Edward V, Rickenbacker, An Autobiography, Prentice Hall, Incorporated, Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, 1967 Ross, John F., Enduring Courage, Ace Pilot Eddie Rickenbacker and the Dawn of the Age of Speed, St. Martin's Press, 2014. Serling, Robert J., From the Captain to the Colonel. An Informal History of Eastern Airlines, The Dial Press, New York, 1980. Whitaker, James C., We Thought We Heard the Angels Sing, E. P. Duckin, New York, 1943. An Account of the Adrift at Sea Experience by Another Member of the Crew. External Links, The Races of Eddie Rickenbacker, 16-Year-Old Eddie Rickenbacker, The Rickenbacker Papers at Auburn University, Adelaide Frost Rickenbacker, Auburn University, Works by or About Eddie Rickenbacker at Internet Archive, Works by Eddie Rickenbacker at LibriVox, Rickenbacker Photographs, Auburn University Digital Library, Fighting the Flying Circus A Euro Text in Public Domain, Entry from Webster's American Military Biographies, July 14, 2008 A Euro 90th Anniversary Commemoration of Eddie Rickenbacker and First Pursuit Group in France, Eddie Rickenbacker, Boy Pilot and Racer A Euro Audiobook Available at iTunes, Eddie Rickenbacker at Find a Grave.